Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another post collab talk tweet jam discussion. Uh, this month, the topic was on protecting yourself and your data from ransomware. And obviously it was, it was uh, uh, a bigger topic than just ransomware. I'm talking about security of collaboration, kind of the broader topic. But I'm joined today by Tobias. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Christian. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Why don't you introduce yourself for everybody? Yes, uh, my name is Tobias uh, Koprowski. I'm living in the, in UK uh, in Hacknall. It's a small town close to Nottingham. Uh, it's a very historical town connected with the IT because this is the place from Ada Lovelace came. So Ada Lovelace, wow. if you don't know, uh, she invented the computer algorithms together mm. with the Charles Babbage. So that is their, her place where I'm living now. Uh, I'm Data Platform MVP for uh, some over 12 years, um, yep. uh, working with the infrastructure, uh, SharePoint, uh, Office 365 security, cybersecurity as well, uh, compliance and the licensing here in the UK and around the world with my clients delivering training, consulting uh, with my small uh, small company. Well, I know this is a topic. You and I have talked about security a couple times before. You participated in the, we did a tweet jam last fall that was, security related um it's uh it's interesting it's one of these topics that uh, you know we 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 hear about different instances of companies being hacked or these huge data breaches sony had their their giant breach years ago it was sharepoint related but it had nothing to do with the failure of the technology it was all all about poor administration of those environments it was the people side where the failures were that caused the data breach. Um, but it's uh, it, it's an interesting topic. It's uh, So actually, um, two of my clients prior to joining Avpoint had, were hacked. And uh, one of them paid the ransomware and the other one did not and had backup and was able to restore very quickly and very little loss of data. Um, I also had for one of my demo tenants, so there's no data, there's nothing out there, but I got like the, I saw that I was hacked, I, I got notifications, it was the one profile on that demo tenant without MFA. And that's what, that's where they got in. And so I could see where that is, and of course I got the threatening letters and I laughed it off, I'm just like, good luck, good with that, there's nothing there. You got nothing, you spent all that time. It's like, but, you know, it, it just makes all of this much more real. Yes, I think so. Uh, you know, um, having a testing tenant, as you mentioned, especially having around the Microsoft 365 is absolutely brilliant idea because you can use this, of course, for uh, prepare your production environment, which is on the different tenant, which always need to be separated for the real real world. As well, you can use this sometimes as a kind of the honeypot, so place where the potentially advers adversaries will go and trying to go into your systems or into your your environment somehow. And so, so we can see this that maybe the same IP addresses later, maybe some adversaries or some email addresses or some kind of data are similar around our production environment and around the testing environment for some reasons. Um, you are absolutely right with that MFA, multi-factor authentications, which from my perspective, of course, should be um, enabled as a uh, uh, best practice, the first best practice by everywhere by default for everyone. Yep. However, we'll probably discuss about this a little bit later. Uh, there are some kind of points around the MFA which we need to have in mind as well around the around our administration. Mm, you mentioned the pro the process uh, about the lack of uh, maybe knowledge of the IT specialist sometimes that the human factor is very very important, and yep. we we had we'll a discussion that as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we had that discussions as well. But so we need to look for the multiple different different aspects. What exactly yeah. happening? Well, that's that's why, and we'll see in the flow of the questions why I broke it up the way that I did of technology, process, and people. And it's funny when you start you ask them the questions, and and we'll get into it. Um, you know, how some people responded to to each one, where they started jumping into the 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 next question, like no just the technology let's focus on the process aspect so let's start things off the first question that i asked was how vulnerable is the modern organization to cyber threats so phishing malware data exfiltration ransomware kind of all those things how vulnerable are we uh let's say 
I should decide, we should define first what is the modern organization. I can assume that modernization is some organizations which is actually connected with the cloud somehow, maybe working with the hybrid environment, probably not organizations which is only on premises because that organization from my perspective is not modern anyway. And yeah. vulnerabilities, I think very, very, very much because we as a IT specialist, uh, security specialist, administrators, we know something. We are trying to protect our organizations as good as we can. Sometimes we have some kind of limitations, like a budget sometimes, like a timing and so on. So we have some limitations with our knowledge quite often. However, uh, adversaries have a plenty of time and they are working very often with the big, bigger groups. So for small businesses, you could have a one person with IT, which is responsible for everything, including security, because no one think about uh, invite, for example, external consultant for making the security better. So phishing, first and foremost, always constantly super active uh, vulnerabilities for our environment because this is the first way how the attacker is trying to go to our systems they're not going for databases they're not going for the sharepoint libraries they don't know where they are but they know where are the users and if they will be able to give some fun, fancy email that you won the 100 amazon voucher last week because you watch on the netflix something and yeah i watched that movie on the, on the netflix yes and i just click done it, you know, it's amazing, I mean, how often it happens. I, I probably see one phishing email, at least, that comes through various filters per day, at least once per day. It is so common now. And some of, so, so many of them are so poorly written and obvious what they are. Others are very fancy. In fact, internally, we did, our security team did some testing. Thankfully, it was, and and number of people failed. I failed as well mm -hmm. because I trusted because it looked like an internal regular email. And and so and then they pointed out afterwards, I said, yeah, I was sloppy. I was on my work email. It looked work related. It looked like something that I see during my day, but there were telltale signs that I should have been aware of. But one of the things that I do is like I will rarely, if ever, unless it's coming from work people, work related, mm -hmm. You know, I will not click on a link to anything, yes. you know, that's especially external. I will go and and hopefully this is a practice for best practice for people. Yes. I get a message from my from my insurance provider or my bank or whatever. I will mm -hmm. never click on a link to those things. I will not even Amazon. I will go to the site. I will log in properly to the site and then go to the message center and updates and things like that. That's one way that you can find out if they're real or not. And, and uh, you know, not surprisingly, there's a few, like I just got a notification. I've got one of my sons on my car insurance, got an email, like it just didn't look right. Went in and logged into my insurance. It was right. And I actually provided feedback back to my provider. I said, you need to improve your templates. This, this looked sketchy with the way that the template that they use, my local office. And I think it works in the both ways because of course, we need to protect our users and our organizations as much as possible uh, against the phishing, for example, because with the phishing could be a malware link for the infected website, info link for the some infected zip file or whatever else, and user link, click for that one user have no idea, of course. But on the other side, sometimes, as you mentioned, some organizations sending emails, which is absolutely legit. And right. it looks sketchy, but only looks sketchy for you because you know this because you seen similar emails uh, 100 right. times in last year and you still remember it. That is something strange here. Uh, when I'm delivering training for the security, I quite often have that discussions with the phishing. I'm showing some examples. I even have about 100 examples in my special ma mailbox about the phishing emails. And the administrators quite often said uh, that, uh, that that email is not OK. That is probably phishing because the grammar is bad. But we are working in the multinational organizations, multicultural organizations. And right. just because from my perspective, you know, I'm not a, my English is not my first language. American, what? of course, is not my first language. <laughs> yeah. And from that perspective, and when I see my different colleagues from the different countries, the grammar is not super much important. Because right. even my English teacher told me many years ago, don't don't think about the grammar too much. Intelligent Englishmen understand you. I still remember this 
20 years after. So that means that even the poor written email or a little bit bad grammar, uh, uh, some administrators said, no, th this email is, is, is wrong because it's the uh, wrong grammar and the grammar is not okay. But for the foreigners working inside these organizations, that grammar is not completely not visible. Right. And that is as well some kind of aspects of the phishing emails. Education of this, I'll oh, probably will discuss about this later as well. Right. Well, and that's why, I mean, it's just, a, again, just a rule of thumb of never clicking on anything in email is a good yeah. rule. Like go to yeah. the source site, log in, look at it from that different perspective. So, I mean, that's just one way around it. Well, a second question, I mean, we kind of start, we started to go down this road. In your experience, what are the primary challenges that are driving the worldwide increase in cyber threats? Well, uh, I think the um, politics and money always driving this. The yeah. actors which coming from the not only private sectors, but as well from the governmental actors. We see what's happening now with the Ukraine and Russia. And we know that the part of this is a very, very big on a very, very big level, the cyber war which exists from very, very long time, but is yeah. more and more and more sophisticated. And we can see this if you're looking for for the couple of different places around the world. Like I was I remember when I when I went for China some 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 years ago and my friend tell me, please remember, take the different device, of course, take the device which using only in China. But please remember, do not enable the VPN because VPN is prohibited. Once you enable VPN, you will have some problems with the local authority because the rules there in that specific place working differently. I think the primary the challenges which uh, we have that cyber threats around us is because we are more open. Adversaries know that we move out from on premises, which was, let's say, working in the box with the security guards, with the reception, with the data center and with our local LAN network. We went from this place to home, to hotels, to airports, to cafe, to club, to whatever else. We move from the PC to laptops, tablets, smartphones, very sophisticated smartphones. Even we quite often moving, and probably you know this very well, wearable devices, yes? Yeah. Yep. So I can, I'm using this sometimes. I reading my emails on my uh, Fitbit. Okay, this is the spot tracker, but as well is connected with my account. So I can right. read my emails and that emails are not protected here completely because it's not encrypted. So I think that adversaries trying to look for every single aspect of that one. We still remember the network at home in, from my perspective, 70% of the private networks at home are not secure because home users never think about that. They still have the routers with the default admin username and admin password. They never change this because there is no reason. If you want to log in for that router, you can even go for the uh, website for the support of the producers, and then you can find what is the default username and what is the, the password. 70% it's still the same. So right. you're sitting down in the car in the uh, neighbor area like, like, like me, you run some, some kind of software and you're listening to the network. And then you know, okay, that network is open, that network is open. Let's try admin password, admin password. Okay, one, two, three, four, what's something? And we in. And then, of course, we're working from home. We're using VPN. Our uh, security department uh, tell us, okay, we have a company laptop, you have a, a VPN. But before VPN, you have an unencrypted and not secure network, which means if you have a guest inside your home network, that guest can simply traveling with you via VPN into your company. Yeah. You know, it well, works in the multiple different ways, much more sophisticated. It's well, it, so there, it, we're much more open. We're much more connected because of the, what started with, as you say, the bring your own device that we, you know, companies wanted to be open, wanted to make it be flexible, let people use the devices they're most comfortable with. We're, we're increasingly, we're hybrid working models now. So we're across those, which makes us much more susceptible. My other answer to this is this is to your other point as you started out is the money, the financial side of things as well, because the, the I think it's just that simple It's because the money's so good. It's so it, to go in there and do that, the the return on that again, when we think of the massive data breaches and we think of the billions of dollars lost for a single company from the massive data breach, well, the cost is even greater as a cost per employee to the small businesses. 
like to to go in 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 like this uh, one of my clients that had you know twenty employees, and I don't know how much they paid. They paid a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars, which they couldn't afford to go and do, but they had to. They had no other choice because they were in the process of redesigning their system and their security and had not yet launched the new protocols. And that's when the breach happened. And that is very important point which you mentioned that the small companies, small organizations, because when you're looking for the big organizations, big corporations, okay, some have been hacked and big organizations been hacked. There is some kind of failure somewhere in the procedures, people and so on and so on. But as well, I, I'm hearing very often from the small businesses, people, companies like 10 people, 20 people, 50 people, we cannot invest in the security. We don't have a budget. We don't have the money. We're just simply working and so on. And that is the process which is very, very, you know, something is missing in that in that case, because right. once we starting to moving to the cloud and sooner or later we're moving with that, cl with that cloud or another, but of course we're talking mostly on the, about the Microsoft cloud. Uh, we have that features. We have that features paid inside the subscriptions. So there is no reasons to not using them. Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's that's an interesting comment. It's like, yeah, we have features that we're not using, huh? <laughs> well, let's let's. So the third question is kind of touches on this: is cloud adoption outpacing our ability to properly secure data? And part of that is we have this. I, and I realize that that might be true in a, in, a, in some percentage of companies that are just not aware. They've got these fe features. They don't know what's there yet. They're not caught up, so they're not utilizing all those things. Some it's just bad practices they've just they 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 just aren't that sophisticated they're not thinking about that and and so much of this it's driven by um a, a breach like a problem happens then they go in and correct the, those behaviors yes we have a, we, we know that the people learn from the from the failures uh, sometimes but uh, i think with the process of them moving to the cloud it should be uh, part of the process as a changing the security approach, changing what happening, what happened on premises before, and what what will happen in the hybrid environment or in the fully cloud environment, that should be the beginning of the process of the migrations at all. And I think that in many organizations we have a problem. Yes, we think that our systems on premises is secure. I used to spend about the 15 years in the data centers, the physical yeah. data centers, yep. hundreds of the servers, clients, and so on. And I can say some of them were secure. Some of them, not that much. Comparing the security level with them, for example, Microsoft data centers or a couple of different cloud providers, some of those data centers were less secure than my home in some mm. specific ways. Because everything depends on what is your approach. And, um, you know, f thinking about the physical security is that completely past. We, we don't think that is the reason why we're moving to the cloud. We don't want to think about the infrastructure. We don't want to think about the physical buildings. That is completely not important. It's fancy to see that Microsoft have anti-tank uh, borders around the, some data centers in the United States. That's perfect. We don't have, but they have. But we can focus on the different things. Problem which I can see is that quite often the budget or management don't have idea how to transform the previous part of the B of the budget into the security approach using right. the features which we have, including trainings testing and implementation. So so one other area, and, and I agree with that, one other problem is that we are utilizing, I don't have the data in front of me, but I, I think it's Gartner that said like the average number of cloud services per company, it's like over 130 SaaS applications being used. Yes. So I guarantee no matter how security minded your organization is, if you're util utilizing an average number of 130 SaaS applications, I guarantee that you are not applying the same level of security, proactive thought and process around all 131 of those. And of each one of those is a is a vulnerable point. 
Of course, and it's enough that from the 130 applications, you will find one which is not using Key Vault for storing the secret credentials, and then you are open. Or one of the applications which developer implemented just, you know, I remember implementations. Yeah, let's do something. Implement some kind of features, some kind of applications. Put this on the test. Okay, it's working. Now switch this to the productions. Okay, switching is the one, one, you know, one button. Switch to the productions. Uh, okay, but. Uh, did we implement the SSL? Did we implement encryptions? Did we implement encryptions to the databases? No, it was on the testing. OK, we will do this later, which means we will do this never. Right. Yes? And that is the approach which we have as well very, very often. And I agree with you, uh, probably uh, with that average number of the of the data, um, one of that applications could be consumed by the adversaries as an entry point into the systems. And it is enough yep. to having one entry point. Adversaries have a time. They can be in our systems for the three months, half a year, maybe later. Depends what they will can uh, achieve from the hacking our environment. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another thing. There's there some of them can be very patient in waiting that out, so to, to make it less obvious that they were able to, to enter. Well, so the, this is where I broke down in the questions. I I broke it down into technology policy and then people so question four was what are your technology best practices to mitigate cyber threats mm -hmm. and we've so, talked about like the utilizing the features that are available for the platforms the the SaaS applications that we are using that's a good place to start actually using the out-of-the-box capabilities of these solutions i think that uh, everything which we have out of the box implemented directly should be used by default uh, MFA, of course, is a standard. Going for the passwordless if it's not, if it's uh, possible, of course. Going for the passwordless, it's absolutely fantastic. I am very big fan of this. However, that that implicate the necessity of changing the hardware quite often. And then company need to, of course, think about okay, we need to replace the hardware because our old uh, Windows Seven uh, machines cannot work with that one because they don't have a physical capability to working right. with the biometric or something else. Yes, I have a, my machine here, the laptop, which I'm using normally for working. That one doesn't have a biometric uh, other than fingerprint, but I have an external camera for that one, which can recognize my face. So I can use one of those options to simply connect. However, uh, uh, technology, MFA, uh, of course, important. I'm a very big fan of MFA, oh, generally two-factor authentications, multi-factor authentications for, from ages, and I'm using this in the multiple different ways. Uh, but I see sometimes a problems. Uh, IT specialists, if they know about the MFA, and many of them know, they are willing to implement, and that is absolutely brilliant. But we need to remember about the users, which maybe not every single time will be able to use the MFA or two-factor authentications in the way how we approach. For example, the most popular probably is the Microsoft Authenticator app and right. maybe some kind of fingerprints. Then if you have a device which doesn't support fingerprints, that MFA will not work. So Windows Hello will not work. If you don't have a smartphone because of something, then your multi-factor authentications will not work. Then you have to work with the SMS, for example. And then, of course, you thinking from the security perspective, or SMS can be simply uh, and relatively easy intercept. Yes, that is kind of risk which we have. But even that, that SMS is much better than nothing in that case. I used to work with the, sometimes I'm working as well with the um, elderly people, with the, for example, uh, some uh, charity organizations. And when you're looking for the elderly people, they have something, I don't know if I have with me now, oh, I can show you um, that one. They're using this, uh, you see? Yeah. This is the book of passwords. And we can laugh at the, as the technical people, but for the elderly people, if they need to go to the shop, for example, log into the systems and selling some goods in the charity shops, they cannot use MFA. They yeah. cannot use something which is high secure because they simply maybe don't have a skills, maybe don't remember, maybe don't know how to use it. And so, so MFA absolutely yes, but it must be flexible. So implement for everyone, who right. can use it, but please look for the some groups of the people which maybe cannot. And then next, after that MFA, enable everything which you have on your license if it's if it's necessary. 
use the security center, use the uh, compliance center, a uh, privacy center inside the risk management. Please do not forget about the inside the risk and inside the risk. I mean, highly, highly um, people which have access for the sensitive data, of course, but as well our management. And I had a lot of that discussions before. Control your CEO, control okay. your uh, CXO because they are vulnerable. Maybe they don't know. But as well, maybe they could be a risk in our organization. Yes. Well, that that's where you've gotten it. You started to go into question five, which what are your policy best practices to mm -hmm. mitigate cyber threats? And that's where it is a lot of the or the rules that you have in there. Just like we've gone where you say, look, I don't I don't want to have policies within the system that are with named individuals. I want it to be role based because what if something happens to that person? They're not available. We then can't get into that system. We need to have other people that need to be able to get into that. Um, you should also have just part of your policies that someone leaves an organization. We run through these specific steps when somebody leaves. In fact, a lot of organizations are very smart. They know, hey, this person, their last day will be Friday. We're gonna take other preventative steps or we're gonna start monitoring and looking at uh, activity and behaviors from these em employees. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can go and do to be, you know, kind of preventive measures, but so much of this that can be, if you are solid in your processes that you're handling these, that your life cycle management, that you already have predetermined, what is the life cycle of content? How do we treat these profiles? What are we doing? Like we have as part of our provisioning process internally for our tenants. So it's, you know, the Microsoft ecosystem. So so Microsoft Teams and SharePoint sites and Yammer communities and OneDrive and third-party solutions. We use Jira, for example, and all these other different places, all these systems that need to be handled. So if someone you know, joins or leaves the organization that they run through and these do these things immediately. But I even get prompted on a regular basis for the teams that I own, for the SharePoint, the sites that I've created that I'm active in daily there is a cycle of uh, you know, at least 90 day cycle where I have to go in there, confirm it's still valid, confirm all the members one at a time that they're all still valid within that, um, update any of the rules around those things. And as I, I, I look, it's a hassle. It's like MFA mm -hmm. is it's a hassle to go in and do that, but I'm now just accustomed to having with the authenticator app, on the desktop. I know the process around it. I understand why the rules are there. It's just become, it's been baked into now the way that I administrate those spaces, those workspaces that I manage. And it's just part of the way that we work. The benefits far outweigh the annoyances of going through the additional steps to, to maintain all, each of those things. And so that's a policy thing. Mm -hmm. we've, we've set up the guardrails and that corrects like technology where we're, we're, things are turned on. We're utilizing the features are we're very security minded as a company, our policies and our technology far exceeds the out of the box alone. So we're more secure than most data centers because we're, we're, we have a, you know, a, a chief security officer. We're that focused on security is important to us, but is that policy part of it? And yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. And that that is the very good example of that of that policy which we which we should have up and running. Um, checking activities from time to time on some specific period of time. It could be 90 days like you like you mentioned. Um, checking what happening in the site, sending the emails about the active and non-active users, checking that reports, checking that activities from the owners of that groups, from the owners of the SharePoint sites or or Microsoft 365 groups and so on. So. Uh, controlling where that groups exist and how they are how they are uh, created, because as you very know very well, the Microsoft 365 groups uh, can be created almost everywhere and we have uh, multiple different places. And sometimes those administrators of that super users are not working together. And not not even connected, but they creating the Microsoft 36 groups, and then we have a behind the scenes. We have of course email, we have identities, we have a multiple different things. So that is very very important part. Um, I think that as well with that with that controlling what happening in our organizations uh, around the around the people which we which we have, uh, we should look for the Microsoft 
identity identity risk management is an absolutely brilliant features for the reasons which you mentioned. We know that someone will go out from our company, so we need to protect that user, of course, a little bit, but our company especially against potentially some kind of problems with that users. So let's run the insider risk management. OK, I know it's required if I have license, but anyway, we have that one in some right. moments. And then we can control what happening with that users and we can control, OK, that user uh, will be with us for the next month, but that user starting, for example, downloading a lot of documents from the SharePoint libraries or uh, right. sending that documents to the well, USB drive. And which is which is part if it's if it's part of their there's actually another reason for having, you know, like audits. It's another reason for having just exception management so that the system you can actually automate and it looks at patterns of behavior that would be out of normal. Like here's an example. I was just thinking of this too, of like, I appreciate the fact my bank contacted me and said that, hey, you spent a lot more in this in, the, in this last week than normal. Mm -hmm. And what happened is um, I had like a bonus at work. I paid off a vehicle. I paid off a car loan. Yeah. And it wasn't a lot, but it was, but it was twice as much as I usually spend in a single month around this. And they're like, was this still you? And I'm like, that's what that that auditing, that automation allowed to go in the do. Say this was outside of the normal pattern of behavior. What's going on? Is this still you? Uh, or I appreciate that every time I would travel internationally and use my American Express and they would do the phone call at the concierge or at the front desk of the hotel. Like, is this you traveling? Yes, that that is me buying you know buying dinner at a restaurant yeah. outside of Manila in the Philippines. Yes, that was me. Because I've had the other times where I had, there was a breach, I don't remember which credit card, it wasn't American Express, but uh, like a Visa card where it's like, is this you? And I was in the Ukraine, like buying food in the Ukraine. I'm like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure I wasn't in the Ukraine yesterday uh, mm -hmm. making purchase. Um, and, and so we like, well, let's send you out another card. Like appreciate that process. You can have that same level of proactive monitoring and pattern uh, uh, watching inside your organization. And that is a very good point because uh, uh, bringing that example from the banking systems, how the banking works and how they try to mitigate the risk and fraud detections and so on about your activities. Yes, you paid a loan for the car or I had the same scenario when I uh, two years ago bought the uh, new server, which is actually under my desk and it cost a couple of thousand pounds and I just simply pay with the, with the card and they called me, hey, you're doing some crazy transactions on that on that uh, online shopping when you're buying something for the some thousands with the one transactions. Uh, is it you, what you're buying and so on? And I really appreciate that I think the educations around that kind of approach, uh, if could be somehow you know migrated into the IT systems, IT yeah. specialists, that could be super great. If you're looking for the SLA service level agreement, we remember that SLA has been created in about, about the 1980s with the telecoms mostly, but the plant of that SLA approach has been migrated into the IT SLA later. But the telecoms was the let's say inventors of the SLA in some specific ways, and we just yep. bring this up. So bringing the same from the banking, as you mentioned. I give you one more example because you mentioned something about the special groups and special um, notifications and observations of that groups. I am a very big fan of not remembering or not using the accounts as a humans or as a people. I'm always looking for the identities. So I remember many years ago when I used to work in the data centers, we had that problems that in my, I used to work in the one company for the 10 years, but I had 14 or 15 CEO. I know it's hard to imagine, but they simply change. And yeah. I was responsible for the SharePoint infrastructure. And I said, okay, guys, I have no time and I don't want to change the permissions and something every single time for the new CEO. It's boring for me. I don't have a time and it's boring simply. Right. So, we created in our Active Directory a special group called CEO, and that was the one person there only, always, almost, yeah. except the moment of the changing, when right. that group had some permissions everywhere to every system. And, you know, I even give the permissions for the HR. Hey, guys, I'm not interested who is my CEO. I never meet that person. So when you have a new CEO, put that new CEO to the Active Directory. You have a permissions and then everything will be sorted and everything was sorted. And for the many, many years, I never think uh, who is my CEO. It's not important. I know that that person has some specific limited permissions for some specific part of the systems. Right. Everything as a reader, almost nothing as a, as a, as a writer. 
sorted. And because we have a role based access control in Azure and in Microsoft 365, and you can use that Airbags, Airbag, Airbag functionalities, if that role will, is not enough, create your own role, add the specific people, and forgot about the, or maybe not, not in 100%, but for me, forgot about the human inside us. It's just the identity, it's just the object which we need to protect in some specific ways. I know maybe a little bit uh, not super kind, but uh, yeah, we still, yeah. Uh, I know the next questions probably will be about the people because. It, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. I was going to make, make the comment. It's like, uh, just funny when you said you talked about our back. I know what you were talking about, but that's one of those that always. So I started <clears throat> my career early in my career. I worked for um, Pacific Bell. So one of the big U.S. phone companies. Yes. And I did data centers like I wrote the the materials in the binders. I was <clears throat> constantly. In fact, I did one of my big, first big projects was a data center consolidation project. It was very secure. I worked with these systems. But and we were actually um, we shut down for three different uh, the systems for the marketing organizations that I worked with. We shut down data centers and consolidated to one a fourth location. And so I learned so much about the protocols and access to the floor. And this was one of those places where um, uh, where it was you know the 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 door at the you know in the beginning of the movie Tron where they they get into the building but it's that massive door that could withstand a nuclear blast it was like one of those facilities yes you know very very tough like you 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 couldn't drive a truck through the front door you know and and survive they, they would be protected but anyway um yeah we you know Arbok in that world, that was the point I was going to make, is the Regional Bell Operating Center. So <laughs> uh, I just still have that acronym stuck in my brain. Yeah, mm. so the next question was, as you point out, question six was, what are your people best practices to best mitigate cyber threats? Because that's really where the lion's share of risk happens. We've turned on all the features, we have the policies in place, and then someone does something stupid. Yes. <laughs> You know, uh, I always mention this, and this is still hard for some organization. Uh, technology is the one thing. We get a lot of technology from the Microsoft. We get the M365 with the E5, and we have uh, hundreds of the features, dozens of the solutions, plenty of the options. We're adding for this Azure subscriptions, we're adding Sentinel, we're adding Azure Security Center, and so on and so on. That's absolutely fine. But we first need to educate the users and the education is a super, super important part. And I'm talking about the educations from the lowest level of the end users, which are completely not technical to the highest level, super technical people. And somewhere in the middle are the management, CEO, CFO and so, so on. You know, we know that that uh, C level people doesn't have time for learning, doesn't have time for something. But even those people should at least attend for the cybersecurity awareness trainings once per year look for that video, answering for some questions, maybe not the same questions every year, and having that information somewhere in the system, yes, that people at least look for that one. That will be very helpful later with the auditing in the post bridge eventually, if you have, have a bridge. But from my perspective, education, education, education is from those levels. We need to remember end users quite often are not technical. End users coming to our organizations doing their job. They're doing something which we don't know. If I will talk with my colleagues from my former company, for example, when I used to work, if I talk with my colleagues in the finance, I have no idea what they're doing. I'm not finance person. They don't know what I'm doing in IT, that's fine, but I need to explain them that we need to implement MFA, passwordless or specific new features like you don't have to anymore put the passwords in your computer. It is not enough that you look for the camera. It, trust me, this is extremely hard for many people. How uh, how to yeah. look for the camera? I use the password for the last 25 years and I remember the password because it's still the same, of course. Right. Yeah, so right. <clears throat> we implementing as IT specialists a lot of things. We enforce our users because we have a power to enforce, but it doesn't mean that they understand. If they not understand, they will not will be with us. They will not they will not helping us. The, right. the knowledge and understanding need to come together and it need to be repeated because once we go into the cloud, I, I always mention it on my trainings and with my with my clients that cloud is a constant change, is the adaptations for the constant change on every level because even Office 365 installed on the PC for the users will be changed every 18 months. Yep. 
So we need to adapt for this. So from my perspective, best practices, education, knowledge, uh, understanding, having some budget for uh, for trainings and <clears throat> many of the organizations as well, because I see this on the trainings, they don't know that the Microsoft have a hundreds of hours training for free on every single level. They said we don't have a budget for trainings. Guys, you don't need to have a budget. You just simply put on the page link for that specific modules or that specific pathway or learning path and invite the people. You can build this together with the with the Microsoft Learn system so you can see that users going for that systems user watching for some videos or some documents or some tutorials and so on. And you can very simply invite on the portal of the Microsoft 365, as you know very well, there is a hundreds of the uh, of the links for the administrators, IT pros, and end users. So you don't have yeah. to spend the budget for that one. It is already done. If yeah. it's not, then you can look for the special trainings, maybe consulting, maybe something else. But it is already available for everyone. You know, I like one of the ideas, like I talked about how my company did like the internal, like the fake phishing emails to kind of test people's knowledge on that. And they did that. They do this on a regular basis. It's just part of our protocol. So you don't, you never know. It's like the fire drill. Yes. Like, you know, it, it, like sometimes they announce the fire drills. Sometimes they don't because they want to test your, your response to that. And you, and you must, and you must to take a part of the fire drill. Correct. No you must participate. Well, that's the thing. I like. I like the idea of, and I would. I would even welcome this in my company. You know, like for the people that fail on the fake phishing, then f force them to go through and complete like a short video, a reminder of that thing. So just to make it more top of mind and look and starting to make yourself aware, knowing that, you know, hey, at any time one of these messages like. Do I, I just got this link for something. Do I click on that? No. What did I learn? I just sat through another 30 minute video a week ago. I'm not going to do it again, but I think that would be a great way. It's almost a gamification of the, of the training for those end users and force those that are failing those steps to do more so that they will, you know, learn that hopefully it will stick and they'll learn not to fall prey to that again. You know, we working we working for uh, for the organizations. We working for the best approach and best results of our company. We're not working for ourselves if we're not working only with the one person company. But even I have my one person company. I'm working for the best results of my organizations. And in the organizations, everywhere is exactly the same. People need to understand that they, of course, doing the job. But as well, the risk which could happen because I don't know they having the phishing emails or like the uh, data exfiltration and ransomware is. Uh, you know, you're probably starting to go for the uh, physical events. Yes, it's slowly starting yep. around the world, some of them. Right. Do you remember that moments when you go for the physical event and you get, for example, that kind of gadget? Yep. Yes, and now my, my I, 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 many of my colleagues from the security security department say, okay, guys, but if you're taking something like this, which is the USB, and even it's written Microsoft, and what is and is the uh, something like uh, the hybrid way, Please do not put this into your computer, right? But one, people will go, people will go for the events. People will get the USB because there is a new oh, 52 gigabytes or 64 or I don't know USB 3.0 or whatever else plugin. Uh, of course, probability that that on the event that USB will be infected is relatively small, but right. in some place it's still kind of risk. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I even think of that. I even still think of that now. Um, you've seen these scams at uh, gas stations, petrol stations, where they'll put like a fake car reader thing over that, and so you go in to to use it, and all it's doing is it's it is it it's it's almost like a it's a little shell over the thing, yes. and it's reading your password, your card information. You're you're still filling up your gas tank, but I it's a, it's enough that I got scared by the news that it happened in my area. That every time I go to the gas station, I'll go over and I'll wiggle on stuff just to make sure, like, is that real? You know, and and it's 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 like when you're walking at night in a sketchy area. You know, you look around a bit more. Yes. And I think we just need to have that approach, like be self-aware of your environment and know that hey, I'm I'm at a hotel. 
I never like I, I don't just go and plug in any of my devices into a USB anything, whether it's on the bed stand for charging or the desktop. I have a power module. I plug it into the outlet. I'm always powering my own through my own device just because I know security minded people that yes. do not plug a USB anything into anything at the airport, for example. They just yes. don't do it. And I'm just like, well, I'm going to be more like my security-minded friends. And you know, I have, a, I have a, that small device, which is just simple USB, yes? And that yep. is for plugging for the, for, for the traveling, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You plug in any of your devices via this. And then no data coming, but you don't know what could be, yes? Especially in the right. hotels and so on and so on. Yeah, uh, I even I had some discussions two, two, two days ago on the Twitter with some of those guys from the United States that uh, you're still using the checks for payments, yes? In They're some places. still legal tender. I don't know anybody who uses them, but they are still there. And I seen some discussions with some of my friends that they they seen in the hotel the guy who pay with that with the check and that the check was the you know the account number reference number and all of those transactions the routing number all that stuff so right routing right. everything so it's enough to you know grab that check you have access for the for the for the account if you have access for that numbers then you can very simply prepare the phishing email hey guys or e <laughs> even know. worse even worse. Some people have, so it has their name, it has that, that, it has their signature. Some people even put their social security number, like printed with the, the information on there, which is just asinine. You yes. are, it, anybody gets their hands on that check. And a lot of banks, it, well, I don't know anymore. It's been away from a long time. My wife worked for Wells Fargo, one of the biggest banks here in the US for years. Yes. Um, and she was a business teller when we first got married and they would throw out canceled checks, not shred them, not destroy them, throw them out. Oh, yes. Like, you know, that was a different time. That was 30 plus years ago. And so we don't have the capability now, but if you, now that would be a treasure trove for, uh, for thieves to go in and find canceled checks, irrelevant bank account number, routing number, name and address, signature, yeah, double everything. verified on that, you know, it's, it's signed on the back of that. You have everything that you need for uh, stealing somebody's uh, uh, person per profile. Yeah, I remember because I used to work in the banking as well for the couple of years. I remember some of the trainings from how to work with the checks from around the world, especially from the United States and how to manage all of this. And I remember that was the, it was a crazy, crazy, crazy part. And of course, three decades ago, we didn't think about this that much. Yes, but now, uh, you know, it's very, very good, good point to grab something and get access for the person. Yeah? Exactly. Well, the last the last question is kind of around that. If your organization has had a data breach, what should be your immediate next steps? Oof, uh, I think it, there is a couple of aspects of this. Uh, from the legal perspective, for example, here in the UK is the ICO, so it's the Information uh, Commission Officer. So there's a special governmental office which need to be informed about the data breach. That's no matter. It could be GDPR or not GDPR. That's no matter. Generally, need to be need to be informed. Uh, the second, I think, uh, we should check from the technical perspective where it happens, what happens, uh, how far the adversaries go, what potentially damage it could be, uh, what kind of uh, information potentially will be available. It doesn't mean I quite often have a discussions on the on the on the trainings that we are talking about the, in the Microsoft 365 about the um, uh, data loss prevention. We have uh, that features It's quite big, a lot of procedures, a lot of automations and so on. But I quite often discuss about the because I still think that they are two DLP data loss preventions and data leak prevention and it is not not even mentioning normally in the down the documentations but for me they are two different two a little bit different topics because if if i will for example for some reasons lost this usb which i show you in that case i personally don't care because i know i probably there are some data here but i don't care that data are encrypted and if that data will be stolen, no one will get access for that one. As well, if I have a copy of that one somewhere else, I don't care as well. So it's just a physical device. The same, it could be laptop, could be something like that. However, data loss and data leak will be completely different because some, of the, some organizations, some of our adversaries going for the systems to 
stealing the data and making some money for the time. Some of them have the idea of uh, disclosing the data. You know, the data breach is happening, as you can see, as you see probably uh, many times in the multiple different places. Sometimes the target is let's steal the data. If we can find the data, let's steal the data and make money of that one. But the other one could be let's steal the data and publish them and make a bigger harm than stealing even. So we had yeah. that case couple couple years ago. I remember here in the UK that one of the um, it was this uh, fun point. I didn't mention this uh, with the first point vulnerabilities as well. Our script kiddies or and or young, young hackers which trying to do something to getting access for our systems. And they did in the in the UK about the three years ago uh, before the election, local election. They just simply. Uh, jump into the into the uh, local election county uh, county systems and delete all of those data of the um, people who uh, who can vote just day before in the evening before the election mm. and the problem was that okay everything was printed before but was nothing in the systems to confirm that the people exist yeah. and that was only for fun for them and let's make good fun let's delete all of those voters and you know the election stop yes and you know the cost and all of those problems and so on, so on. So it's very important to looking for what is the target of that of that users. And then when we have a data breach, of course, informing our employees. Uh, you probably seen on the on the Twitter. I don't remember the name of that university, but it was in the United States two or three days ago. They have a, a ransomware attack, and they po post the informations on the Twitter and everywhere on the social media for everyone, students, teachers, and so on. Hey, we have a ransom, a ransom attack. Switch off your computers, plug off your computers, and so on. That was kind of probably, you know, ad hoc policy in some way. Uh, not, yeah. not that bad, not that bad. Uh, in, in anyways, we know that the students using the Twitter or Instagram or social media, uh, anyway, not that bad approach. However, informing the clients, informing the users, and of course, being ready to discuss with the uh, marketing, which should be responsible for informing the users, uh, informing the, 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 the clients and the business. Uh, auditing, so of course, talking with our auditors and working with the auditors, very important part. And I think this is the personal problem for many. Do not, we, we should avoid as much as possible to hide anything. Everything should be okay inside our organizations. Everything should be for the specific people available, which means auditors come and say, okay, what happens? And we should have a, some kind of personal responsibility. Yes, I just simply missed something or something like that. Because sooner right. or later, that information will be visible somewhere because we can check the audits. It will take maybe weeks, maybe months, but you can find that information. But as soon as possible, we can find those moments that, yes, I made that mistake and that probably is a part of this. We can mitigate this faster for the right. next part. Right. I think that the, the last part of the data breach, and that is again very discussionable because, you know, in the I know in which company you work, of course, and I know this company very well from years, but in the Microsoft 365, we do not have a backup. Yes, the concept of the backup and restore not exist at all by definition, by default, by design. And we have a third party organizations which coming to our systems and helping us to keeping this. And now the questions which I quite often have with my customers and with my students on my trainings is why we still have a policy for having a backup? Because that policy has been written in the time on premises when we didn't have a cloud quite often, yes? Yeah. 20 years ago, three decades ago, maybe, maybe, maybe even even I don't know, four four decades ago. And that policies that you know ISO 27000, PCI DSS, all of those compliance standards are still very, very much connected with on premises. And in on prem on premises, yes, okay, you have to make a backup, two copies uh, or three copies, one outside, one offline, and so on. So on. we know this very well. But in the cloud, it not exist. So I think that from the beginning, the approach of the preparations for the potential data breach should be different. Yes, we can of course use the field party solutions and make a backup storing the somewhere else, or using retention policy, using um, uh, any kind of other policies which you have inside our system, but planning this very, very, very much. And the maybe last part which I want to add for the data breach. It will be great if we have a before data breach. 
a strictly written procedure who is responsible for what. Because mm. I remember I had a couple of the uh, disasters in my data centers and uh, it sometimes is extremely hard to find who is responsible at that moment to do something. Because no one wants to take a responsibility. Hey, we have a data breach. We have a problems. Data disappear. Someone's stealing our data. We have a ransomware. Who is responsible? Not me, not me, not me, not me, not well, me. That's also, it's important to understand the roles and responsibilities. So as part of that auditing process, where you're going back and looking at it, was it a failure of the technology? Was it, a, and there's, uh, and and if there was a failure in the technology, was it that it was misapplied? Was Did the technology itself actually fail? Was there a hardware component? Was there a software failure? Because there might, depending on the cost of the, that release, that there there is some liability for the, the, the technology providers that mm -hmm. are involved. Was it a policy, a failed policy, an inadequate policy? Um, was it applied or was it you know end user, user related at some level? So you go back and look and say that like, oh, I see that it was like we had one admin who was doing this role. It was all, uh, you know, it wasn't automated. They were doing manually a lot of the steps. They were on vacation. So therefore certain things happened. They were out, it wasn't being done. There was a gap in information. And one of the arguments that made around a cloud backup, because a lot of them say, it's like, well, like with Microsoft 365, it's like, well, you know, hey, with Microsoft data centers and the platform, like they're doing backups. Like, yeah, they back up the entire system for 14 days. Like you want more granular. Do you want to have to do a, like you lose days of data up to 14 days and beyond that, good, you, that's it. Like you don't have mm -hmm. that. Um, do you want more granular control? Do you want to be able to go and look at a specific workload with a specific user that lost that or up to the entire system? And do you want it more than 14 days back? You know, so anyway, there's, and, and for, for some organizations, you also have to look at what industry am I in? What laws and regulations pertain to what rules are in place that I must adhere to? And your technology and your process, the out of the box capabilities may not, even at that, that basic level, adhere to or, or make you compliant with those regulations. So you also have to be careful and look at that, understand the rules, the regulations, the industry, the best practices, uh, and, and and you can't just take for granted that whatever those 130 or more SaaS applications, all of them may say, we are compliant with GDPR. We are compliant with whatever country or regulatory rules for industry. They may be compliant. You may not, as a customer of those services, may not be compliant in using their solutions because yes. people are funny that they may not do everything by the intended scenario that the that this service outlines. And maybe you just have applications which simply are up and running. Developers created that uh, that applications, but they never connected for the, for example, for the GitHub or for the other source control systems. And then your uh, your applications is is hacked, and your applications code is disapp disappear, and it is over. Yes, because you didn't you didn't remember. Yes, maybe we should have all of those applications as well in our source control systems, uh, because we want to be sure that if something will happen accidentally or intention intentionally, we can following that one. We can auditing and we can restore for that place which we want, in that moments which we need uh, for that for that system. Yeah? So. A lot of things, a lot of automations, hundreds of the solutions uh, in the Microsoft 365 and in the Azure working together as a platform, but not so easy sometimes. So I think, again, uh, that education, understanding knowledge and collaborations, again, collaborations around Mm, uh, no, DevOps is very, very popular, but Sec DevOps as well should be a popular or different kind of connections between the different departments working together for keeping that environment up and running and in the good conditions is super very important sometimes it's I, just the personal problems i you know i put all of that everything you just described of of taking to these different areas and having an ongoing conversation it's not like hey it's a checklist and we've done all 10 things and we're good we're secure like no it's the ongoing discussion 
That's the governance discussion. And I know that you say the word governance and people like their eyes roll back or they fall asleep instantly, you know, those those discussions. But that's what we're talking about is being that proactive, having conversations about the changing the technology that's being used, the processes that are in place, the 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 usage patterns of our of people and constantly looking at that with the changing business patterns and business rules and requirements that are out there and looking at, all right, how do we best adhere to that? What patterns of behavior do we see? What threats are we seeing that are increasing? What breaches have happened or what, uh, uh, you know, what forays by bad actors into our system? Like, what are we, what are we seeing that we need to strengthen education for end users on these topics or, Hey, we need to shore up our 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 security on this, or be prepared with to make sure that we were doing weekly backups. We need to move to every night um, while we look at this 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 issue, so that we aren't as open to to risk. But that should be that matter of discussion across stakeholder organizations on a regular basis. I think yes, I agree. I agree with you, but I want to add one more one more point for that. Uh, we we discussed uh, yesterday on the Twitter uh, on the call up uh, call up talk around this uh, that we should uh, that we should find which informations are sensitive for us, which means which informations need to be protected because uh, the organizations have a tendency as well. I see this to okay because we need to protect. Let's protect everything, and sometimes it not necessarily doesn't make sense because uh, you know you could have uh, some completely testing tenant which you don't care completely because even the tenant will explode. Nothing happened because it's just the testing tenant. Yes, or you could have some repositories. I remember the SharePoint 2010 times and one of my clients, he put the ISO files into the SharePoint. Yes, and he was very happy. Everyone have access for ISO files. OK, but your database is, you know, huge and it works very, very slowly. Do we need to have a ISO files for our systems or for our applications keeping in our backup procedures every night? They are not changing. Yes, they're changing, I don't know, maybe once per quarter, maybe. So maybe once per quarter, but different practices, different policies, and so on. And maybe finally, we have a data of our users, our users working on the multiple different devices. We synchronize uh, everything to the one drive. Yes, it's super, super efficient for the user. Synchronize every desktop and downloads and the my documents to the one drive, and everything is, is sorted automatically for users. Then we don't care about the device, yes, because that laptop or tablet, it's just the physical thing. The interface, right. Interface, yes. yes. Right. If it's encrypted, yep. if it will be stolen, Okay, let's take another one from the stock, uh, demote the, uh, the, the old one, uh, block this in the systems, give the user a new one, download everything from the cloud, and and it's done. Yes, so yep. the approach must be different. The, the management on every single levels, supporting of the management, supporting of the IT specialist, and again, education, knowledge, and understanding for the end users. They need to know why. We as organizations doing those things when we're doing this and how they can help us to doing this in the right way, then right. everything, maybe not everything, but a lot of things will be much, much, much easier for our organization. Agreed. Well, Tobias, really appreciate your time today. Uh, for folks that obviously if you've got, if you're watching this, uh, you know, Tobias is a great resource. Reach, reach out out of the UK, um, Shadowland Consulting uh, there, uh, you know, connect with them. I'll have the links, of course, within the blog post and within the YouTube video as well that you can get reach out to to him. But hey, it's great seeing you. And uh, hey, I'm over your way in June. I'll be in London for the Commsverse event. I might be staying a few extended days. So uh, I don't know, maybe yeah. I will jump if the, if, yeah. you know, if the train will work, because uh, my friend went for the London yesterday and he cannot go back home because no trains are working. Oh, really? Uh, you know, <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, you know, oh, the, the I was going to say that maybe I could come up and visit. It's been a while since I've been up in the <laughs> Nottingham, but uh, uh, but if the trains aren't working, yeah, that that <laughs> kind of puts a, a damper on things. But. Yeah, you can you can always visit Nottingham. We can we can find some nice places to 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 discuss about the technology. 